everyone. Welcome to Quirky Cooking Chats. I'm Jo Whitten, your host, and I'm really happy to have you here in my kitchen with me today. We're going to cook, and we're going to chat, and we're going to have a lot of fun. This podcast began as a quirky journey in 2014 when I began sharing my son's journey through severe OCD and anxiety. Um, we've all healed so much since that time, and as the coronavirus kind of all happened this year and there's been so many changes in 2020. One of the things that I really noticed is that people wanted more help with the practical everyday cooking and um, bringing healing foods into their diet without it being completely overwhelming. So I've decided that I want to show you how, the, how I do that. So I'm recording videos of my cooking and talking you through the how and why behind what I'm doing. Um, and I'll be answering your questions each podcast as well. So you can either just listen in to the podcast while you're working in the house or going for a walk or driving. Um, you can listen while you're cooking or you can play the video and actually cook along with me. So I hope you enjoy it and I hope you get a lot out of it. Thanks so much for being here. Let's cook. Today we're going to be talking about meat stocks and bone broths and I'm going to show you how to make simple meat stocks that you can use in your cooking to give them another layer of flavour and to give you the beautiful gut healing benefits of the amino acids in stocks. We're going to talk about the difference between stocks and broths, how to make them, how they're used, I'm going to answer your questions. Um, I've got lots of questions from listeners that have been sent in. So we're gonna go through those. But first of all, before we get started, I just want to give you a few updates on what's happening in the quirky cooking world. So for those of you who do struggle with health and you really need some help getting your health on track, uh, my good friend, Elise Comerford, who is a nutritionist and a gut health specialist, uh, we're working together to present a program, an online program, where you can walk through the stages of improving your gut health with us and we're with you every step of the way. It's an eight week program. You have access to all the information for 12 months and we have live videos every week where we um, do things like cooking workshops, question and answer sessions. We um, teach you how to just really put these principles of good gut health into practice in your family without all the stress and overwhelm. And that's one thing that we're really passionate about is reducing that stress because you will not heal if you're so stressed out about your diet and you're so stressed out about all the changes you need to make um, that it will really undermine what you're trying to do. So our biggest focus is on reducing the stress both in the kitchen and just lifestyle stress and busyness and craziness and intense crazy lives that we often lead, reducing that stress, calming things down so that you have the headspace and the mindset of healing. Um, and so then we're gonna walk through introducing healing foods little by little in a really gentle way so that you can start to bring them into your everyday family food. Um, nothing crazy, nothing too different. Probably your family won't even notice for a while. Um, and then as you bring in these healing foods and you start to see changes and you get the energy and you're ready and motivated, we'll start to take out some of the less healing foods, but that's later in the program. So this is a really gentle approach. It's based on the foods that um, are traditionally known to help heal the gut. Um, we use the principles of the full GAPS diet, but you don't have to be doing GAPS to do this program. Um, those principles are definitely applicable to anyone and you can bring in whatever you can cope with. You don't have to do complete gaps. Um, and so we want you to just relax and start to um, really soak up the principles of good gut health and start applying the ones that suit you and your family in your specific situation. Elise deals with um, a lot of really chronic health issues and has been an amazing help to our family and to many, many other families all over the world. Um, and you can talk to her in the program about any specific health issues that you or your family have and she can work with you on those as well. 
So if you want to know more about our gut health program, it is starting on the 30th of July, the next intake. Um, if you're listening to this and the 30th of July has already passed, if it's only a week or so, you'd probably be fine to catch up. Otherwise, we will have another intake later in the year. Feel free to email me at help at quirkycooking.com.au to ask any questions you have about the program and you will find the link in the notes below. All right, let's start cooking. So we're gonna make two types of stock today. I like to keep stock stocked up in my freezer <laughs> um, and I like to have beef and chicken pretty much on hand at all times if I can because I like to use them as a foundational part of a lot of my recipes. So you get beautiful flavor from a short cooked stock, from a meat stock, um, and it's a great foundation for a lot of meals. Um, you don't have to use fancy ingredients and you don't have to um, you know, fuss around a lot in the kitchen if you've got good basic ingredients and a nice tasty stock. So that's one of the reasons I make stock and we're going to talk about other reasons later in the podcast, but let's first of all, get started. So here I have some bones. Now these are beef bones and you can see that they're still half frozen. Um, they have meat on them, so that's what you want. You don't want bare bones that have been already roasted um, for a meat stock. You want raw meat on the bone. Um, so a couple of centimeters of meat on the bone is good. Get a few of those if you can. Also get some marrow bones. You can see that marrow in there is quite thick. The, the thing about marrow is you'll get a lot of flavor with that marrow, but it's also something that's just really nutritious. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute as well. Um, and then you want to get some knuckle bones in there if you can, because then you're going to get that beautiful jellyish stock from the um, gelatin in the bones. All right. So I, I'm using, for a six litre pot, I'm using three big meaty bones, one marrow bone and one knuckle bone. But honestly, just use what you've got. If you've got um, oxtail or ossobuco, those will work as well. And you don't have to worry with the meat stock. Um, you know, when you're making a bone broth, you cook it to death and so it ends up with this rubbery meat that you can't actually do anything with. Um, with this meat stock, you're only cooking it until the meat is nice and soft, so you can use the meat in other um, dishes. So something like an osso buco is perfect for a meat stock because once you finish making the stock, then you go on to make a meal with it. Um, and that's the same with the chicken. You're not going to cook it until the chicken's tough. Um, you're only cooking it until the chicken's soft, and then you've got that beautiful soft poached meat as well as a tasty meat stock. I'll just aim the camera down here for you. Okay, so you can see I've got two six litre pots. One is a big heavy ceramic lined um, cast iron pot. So like Chasseur or Le Creuset, they are good. The only problem I find with them is that the enamel eventually wears out and you have to get it replaced. So my preference is for um, a big, heavy stainless steel pot like the Solid, Tex Solid Technics Noni um, range. And this six litre Noni Rondu is my fave. I've only got one of them though, and I'm gonna make two different stocks. So I'm using my old just serve pot as well. So I'll pop the beef bones into the, the just serve pot. Now making a meat stock is super simple and you pretty much can't mess it up. So if you're not used to making stocks, don't worry. Also, you will find that it's not smelly. So you know when you make bone broths, um, sometimes people complain about the smell and so they make them in the laundry or something. Um, with a meat stock, you actually get beautiful flavor and a lovely smell. It just smells like soup cooking. Okay, I'm gonna go and cover that with water. So you want to have about two centimeters of water above the meaty bones. No more than that, because otherwise the concentration of the amino acids won't be as great, so you won't get that jellyish stock. Um, so yeah, about two centimeters above the bones. So use filtered water, that's also important because you don't want 
um, basically chlorine and bacteria and things in your stock. You want a good clean stock. So I'm going to go and fill that up with filtered water. Okay, there you go. You can see that I've just covered it with the water. Now I'm going to add some salt. I like to use either a Celtic sea salt or um, Australian pink lake salt. You can get either of those in my online store. Um, and I like to have a container of salt on the bench for cooking. And then I use a salt grinder for the table salt. So this just makes it easier if you've got a little container for your salt when you're cooking. So you can just get your two teaspoons of salt out for your stock or however much you need and, and for your other cooking. And it's easier than grinding it over a um, pot. You won't, it takes a little bit of time otherwise. Okay, some good quality pepper, cracked pepper. So I'm using the Aussie pepper kibble. Um, that one also I sell in my store. The reason I use this Aussie pepper is um, it has amazing flavor. It's pesticide free and sustainably grown and it's local to me, which is very rare because in Australia we don't grow much pepper. So if you can get some Aussie pepper, that's a great idea. Now, the reason for pepper in your stock is because it actually helps to draw the nutrients out of the bones and, and it also tastes amazing. All right, so we'll get that simmering. Okay, so I'm just gonna put that onto the highest heat for, this, for at first because as I said, I'm using frozen bones. I wanna get that really bubbling and boiling and then I'll turn it down to simmer on the lowest heat. Get the chicken into this pot. Okay, here I've got a frozen carcass from a pasture raised summer lad chicken. This one's a local um, farm, well, three hours from me. The um, farmer comes and drops off chicken to my door once a month, I'm very lucky. Um, and they're beautiful heritage breed summer lad chickens. Um, so I've got one big meaty frame here. And I've also got some chicken feet. If you're lucky enough to be able to get good quality chicken feet, they make the best stock because you get that really gelatinous stock from them. The other pieces and parts that you can use in your chicken stock, you can just use chicken drumsticks, you can use chicken wings. Um, if you want to, you can use a whole chicken and then use the chicken afterwards to make a meal out of. Um, really any part of the chicken is fine for a meat stock, but you do want to have some meat on there and you do want to have the fat and the um, cartilage, so like the wing tips or the feet or the, um, the knuckles from the drumsticks. So you want that in there because it will actually really help with the gelatinous outcome of your stock. So you want to get those beautiful um, healing amino acids in your stock, the proline, glycine, collagen, that's what you want. We're going to just use one frame and and what is it? Four, four feet for a six litre pot of stock. Um, but I do quite often make it with a whole chicken and I'll also talk to you about how to do that and how to use it afterwards. So I do have a tendency to cook from frozen when I'm making stocks. It's just heaps easier. Um, I generally don't remember to thaw them out, but that's okay. As long as you bring it to a boil, at a rolling boil and then turn it down to a simmer, it's fine. With the whole chicken, I wouldn't put that into a slow cooker frozen and start it because it's cooking at too low a heat. Um, so that could be um, not great for the bacteria could be um, multiplying inside it. So you want to bring it to a boil and have it at a rolling boil for a few minutes and then turn it down. All right, so I'll just go and pop some water in there. I'll just show you this. Um, I haven't quite covered the carcass with water because um, I'm only using one carcass and four feet in the, and there's like three centimeters of water over the feet. So I kind of just average it out, you know, like um, approximately covered. Because <laughs> if you put too much water in there, um, you'll end up with a watery stock. Some pepper in this one. And salt. A lid on. So you don't need vinegar in a um, you don't need vinegar in a meat stock. You can if you want, but the vinegar, the purpose of the vinegar is to draw the minerals out of the bones. And when you're making a meat stock, 
you're not cooking it for as long um, as a bone broth, which is when you're really going to draw the minerals out of the bones. So while they start cooking, I'll talk to you about what the difference is between a bone broth and a meat stock and which one you want to use depending on what stage of healing you're at. Okay, I've got those on high heat, both burners, and I'll just wait till they start boiling and then I'll turn them down. Um, and then I'll simmer them for two hours for the chicken and three to four for the beef bones because they're, they take longer to really um, get the goodness out of them. Okay, let's talk about the difference between bone broths and meat stocks. Bone broths have had a lot of attention in the last few years as a gut healing superfood. And yes, they are amazing. They're very nutritious and they're great for getting all those minerals out of the bones and into your food. Um, the only thing is they're not the best option for healing the gut. So if you are trying to work on having a healthy gut, if you've got leaky gut, so you, basically if the lining of your gut is damaged, which is very common in our um, Western society where we have a constant bombardment of um, toxins in our environment, um, chlorine in our water, um, we have antibi antibiotics in our water, sadly, we have it in our, um, some, some of our food, we have it in our medications, um, we have a lot of refined foods which also will work on damaging the gut. Um, so the gut lining is affected by all of these things and most of us have issues throughout our lives and especially as we get older with um, our gut being damaged. So in my family, the um, symptoms of having leaky gut or a, or a damaged gut lining um, were food intolerances, itchy skin and rashes, um, headaches and um, constant colds and uh, hay fever, histamine issues. Um, let's see, what else, candida. So all of these things are partly caused by a damaged gut lining and also by the microbiome being um, unbalanced um, and can genetics come to play a part in all of that. So working on healing the lining of your gut is a really good idea. And even if you feel like you've got a healthy gut and you don't have any food intolerances or histamine issues or SIBO or any of the things that are so common these days, it's still a good idea to maintain the health of your gut by bringing in some meat stocks into your diet as well as other foods, which we'll talk about in further episodes. Okay, so a healing meat stock, the reason why it's so good for your gut lining is because the meat stocks contain amino acids like glycine, proline, gelatin, collagen, and these are like the glue that holds the cells together. It makes up all of the connective tissue in our bodies. Um, so when you're, when you're consuming meat stocks, you're getting those beautiful amino acids into your body in a way, in a form that your body can easily use. And so it helps to mend those damaged cells and bring that tissue lining the gut back together into a tight, um, a tight weave. It's kind of like a, you know, you think of cheesecloth um, and how it has those tiny little holes in it. Um, it is meant to be like that, the lining of the gut, but the, the holes are supposed to be really tiny. And so if it's torn, it's like a tear in the cheesecloth. And then um, proteins can escape from your bloodstream into that, sorry, from your gut into your bloodstream through those torn little places in your in your gut lining and then your body can react to those proteins because it thinks oh it's an invader it's not meant to be here and so it attacks and so then you may have the food intolerances and the food reactions and all sorts of things going on there so the the meat stocks have the amino acids which help to heal those damaged tissues um, so to the difference between a meat stock and a bone broth when you cook a bone broth for a long, long time, so eight hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, um, sometimes they're cooked for a very long time, those delicate amino acids like proline, glycine, collagen, 
they actually break down and, and dissipate in the stock and you don't have as much of those. You have more of the minerals and you have more of the gelatin that's drawn deep out of the bones, but it's not the same as the, as the um, short cooked stocks. It's not the same amino acids and it's not as healing for the gut lining. So when you're just starting on a gut healing diet, it's important to have the easiest to digest foods because your body needs to be able to quickly use them to start healing um, and not have to work as hard. Um, so you wanna have a really short cooked stock so that it's very easy for your body to, to make use of. Um, later, when you've healed a lot, um, you can go back to bone broths if you want to. You can start buying those um, bone broth concentrates, which is super handy to have in your fridge and you just want to add to a meal here and there. But if you're just in the early stages, it's better to have meat stocks. And really, it's not that hard to do. If you work, you can come home from work at the end of the day, pop a meat stock on. It'll be cooked just after dinner time. Cool it down quickly in a sink of cold water, pop it into containers and freeze it and it'll all be done before bedtime. Um, or you can um, do it on the weekends, get some stock made and get it into the freezer. So it's not difficult and I always try to have some on hand. And as I mentioned at the start of the video or, or the podcast, depending on which one you're listening to or watching, um, it really does taste better to have a short cooked stock. Um, I know when I first started making bone broths, I was adding all sorts of veggies and herbs and um, everything to try and give it a good flavor because it had that funny wet meat. I don't know, it was a weird, yucky taste sometimes, especially the beef broth and then it had this big layer of fat on top and it was just not very appetizing unless you flavored it with garlic and herbs and veggies and everything. But meat stock honestly is so delicious that even if all you put in it is salt and pepper, it still has beautiful flavor. What I love to do is when it's finished cooking and I'm ready to have some, um, if I'm having it on its own, I'll quite often just add some freshly minced garlic or turmeric, some fresh herbs maybe, um, and then just season to taste if it needs um, the seasoning adjusted. Sometimes a squeeze of lemon, but honestly, even on its own, it's really delicious. Um, it tastes like chicken soup, the chicken one, um, and it doesn't smell odd. Okay, so when you're um, just starting to make your stocks, you do want to look for good quality meat um, as, as best as you can. You know, I know not everybody has access to really good chicken um, like I do. I'm very lucky to have um, such a great um, option to buy locally and I know not everyone can get organic beef but as much as you can get pasture raised animals who live that live as close to nature as possible because the way that an animal is raised and their health actually will affect the health of the food that you're consuming um, for instance if you have let's turn that off um, for instance, if you are eating grain-fed beef, I'm not sure if you understand the difference between grain-fed and grass-fed, but just for a short explanation, um, grain-fed beef has a completely different ratio of omega-3s and omega-6s. These um, fatty acids are really important in our bodies, but the natural ratio is only... I better check that. Hang on. Okay, so the difference between, between grass-fed and grain-fed beef, um, as you probably know, we do need good quality fats in our diet. It, it's brain food, it's um, food for our hormones, it helps us to digest the nutrients in our vegetables, um, and the essential fatty acids um, that are in food, they're named that because they are required in the biological process in our bodies biological processes and um, as opposed to fats for storing and providing energy they are used in bodily processes so um, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids I'm sure you've heard of those um, they are really important but the balance the ratio of these two fats are really important so a natural diet from like the kind of diet that our um, ancestors have eaten for thousands of years 
um, has a natural ratio of about um, one is to one, omega six and omega three. That's what it should be. That's the ideal. So grass fed cattle, um, when they've tested the, I'm just gonna turn these down because they're starting to simmer now and I don't want them to overflow. That would be embarrassing and then I would have a big clean up. <laughs> okay, so the natural um, ratio should be one is to one. Grain fed beef um, has a ratio of about seven to one, omega six to omega three. Um, and that's not a good thing. <laughs> More is not better in this case. You actually need them to be around the same amount. Um, it's to do with heart disease, inflammation, autoimmune diseases. These are all affected when the balance is out. So if you struggle with any of these kind of um, issues, like you have autoimmune disease or you have problems with inflammation, it's really important for you to eat grass-fed beef because that has been tested at about 1.5 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. So you're getting much better um, ratio of grass-fed. Grain-fed um, beef can actually even get up to 16 to one, like if it's a factory farmed, um, you know, uh, that, that kind of beef, it can actually have even worse ratios of um, omega-6 to omega-3. So yeah, a really high concentration of omega-6 in the diet has been linked to things like memory problems, confused behavior, Alzheimer's disease, um, and yeah, it's not weight gain, depression, anxiety. So um, it's not actually uh, a great thing to have a lot of omega-6s in your diet. You wanna keep that ratio as close to the omega-3 ratio as possible. Um, so there's another thing that's really great about eating grass-fed beef as opposed to grain-fed um, in nature, animals self-medicate, if you like. Um, when they're unwell, they will seek out the plants they need to get well. They instinctively know what they need to eat and they will go and find them in the wild. Um, cattle that are allowed to roam in fields and have a variety of plants in their fields and a variety of grasses um, they will do this, even cattle in captivity, um, farmed cattle, they will go and look for the plants that they need when they're unwell. So they get a wide variety of plants in their diet. Cattle obviously that are kept in um, sheds or whatever and are fed grains, they don't get this benefit. So they don't, they're not as well. So then they often have to have medications, antibiotics, different things to keep them well. Um, when we eat animals that are unwell, it affects our health. It's pretty obvious. Um, so we need to be eating the best version of beef, chicken, fish, etc., that we can find, the closest to nature. Um, and you know, you do the best you can and don't stress out if you can't get completely organic, but try to get at least pastured, grass-fed beef, also pastured chicken. Um, free range, um, same with your eggs. And when it comes to seafood, looking for wild caught seafood. Um, lamb, you want the grass fed pastured lamb, which most lamb in Australia is. Um, although apparently there's a little bit more grain fed these days. Um, so just check, it, check at your butchers and ask them where they get the lamb from, where they get the beef from, how it's fed. Um, don't be afraid to ask, it's okay. Um, and they're quite happy usually to talk to you about it. If you've got a good butcher, you can ask them all these questions. Um, and obviously it is more expensive to buy good quality, but as you learn to um, use every part of the animal, and as you also bulk your meals out with lots and lots of veggies, um, you'll find that you can manage this quite well. I think for me, whenever I've gotten slack with my cooking and um, done, gone the easy path, like, oh, just grab some steak for dinner and you know, and you end up just having steak and mashed potatoes and peas or something. Um, if you eat like that all the time, it actually gets quite expensive. But if you um, buy, if you can, get uh, 
quarter of a beast or a cow um, in from a co-op um, or a half even if you've got a really big freezer or share with friends and divide up the order and then you've got all different parts of the cow you've got the bones and the meaty bones for your stock um, you've got the um, fat to make your tallow from you've got the steak which is a treat there's only a little bit of it um, you've got the mince and the liver and the tongue you've got the um, osso cuts you've got all sorts the beef ribs and it not only will save you money um, it'll also make your cooking a lot more creative and a lot more um, and your food and your diet will be closer to what human beings have eaten for thousands of years and have thrived on um, and you'll learn to really stretch out your meals with lots of veggies and get the benefits from that as well. One thing I really love about meat stocks is that you can um, use a meat stock as a base of a meal and not add very much meat at all. Um, and you're still getting those really good quality proteins into your meal, so you don't have to worry about not having enough protein, um, but you're making a much less expensive meal. Um, so when I'm doing a meal with chicken stock, for instance, I'll quite often cook the whole chicken or pieces of chicken and make the stock, and then remove the meat from the bone and um, freeze some of it, some of the meat, and then use some of it in the with the stock to make, for instance, a um, stir fry, a sweet and sour, um, a pho, um, all different meals and dishes with with the stock and a little bit of chicken. Now, I promised to tell you some ideas for using a whole chicken in your stock. Okay, so you can cook a whole chicken as soon as it's soft, like within two hours. If it's a heritage breed chicken, it may take a little bit longer. So depending on the size and the type of chicken, um, sometimes it's two and a half hours or so. Um, once it's soft and you can easily pull the meat off the bones, take, well, once you can um, put your fork into the chicken and it's very soft and it separates easily, don't pull it off. Take the chicken carefully out of the stock, put it into a baking dish and you can either butterfly it open or you can just leave it whole. Drizzle it with olive oil or melted ghee. Sprinkle some herbs over. If you like, you can do some smoked paprika and some chili and whatever you like. Put some flavors in there. And then pop it into a really hot oven, so 200 to 220, and let it crisp up the skin. So it only take about 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how, how hot your oven is. Um, and then once that's crispy, you can serve that like a really delicious roast chicken with some veggies. You can have roast veggies already in the oven. Um, and then you've got a big pot of stock, plus you've got a roast dinner. So I know um, probably most of us grew up doing it the opposite way where you roast your chicken and at the end of the roast dinner, you collect all the bones and make a, a broth with it. Honestly, that's not as tasty and you won't get that really good gelatinous broth, which is um, stock, which is so good for your gut. So start, do it back to front, do it the quirky way <laughs> and um, start with making the stock and then roast your chicken and you'll get a great result. You'll love it because the meat is so soft from being poached and then the skin is all crispy and then you've got this beautiful delicious stock to use as well. All right, so I will be back later to show you the end result and give you some more ideas for ways to use your stock. Okay, I'm back. It's been a couple of hours, so the chicken stock is definitely ready. I'll show you what that looks like. So you can see that chicken stock has reduced a bit. The level was, oops, the level was probably about here when I started. Um, one of the secrets to making good stock is to let it simmer on really low heat with a good heavy pot and a well sealed lid otherwise you'll lose a lot of the liquid into evaporation just make sure that the bones are mostly covered with water so you may have to top it up now and then if you've got a pot that a lot of liquid escapes out of um, via steam you can see here we go with the the beef stock so it hasn't really evaporated very much oops can you see that not really <laughs> okay so there's the beef stock i know that doesn't look pretty it has got a fair bit of fat in there, but don't worry because if you end up with a thick layer of fat on top, you can use that fat in cooking. So I'll show you those once they're completely finished. 
So the kind of dishes that I use for storing my stock are these glass dishes that are great for fridge and freezer. Um, they have all different sizes, different brands. Some of the ones that I use are glass lock, Pyrex, Decor. So you've got the glass dish with the plastic lid and they stack in the freezer. Um, just when you make your stock, just cool it down really quickly in a sink of cold water, sit your whole pot into a sink of cold water, cool it down and then decant it into your dishes and then pop those straight into the freezer. That's the best way to store your stock because if you just leave it in the fridge, for one thing, you'll probably forget about it, which I've done many a time and then had to throw it away, which makes me want to cry. <laughs> um, but it's also a problem if you've got gut health issues, you probably have some issues with histamines. And so if you leave your stock in the fridge for days, the longer you leave it, the higher the histamine levels. So when you make your stock, the best way to do it is to quickly put it into containers get it in the freezer and then it keeps the histamine levels low. Now, I know a few of you have asked about histamines. Um, if you do have histamine issues and you need a low histamine stock, the best meat to use is lamb. So you'll get a lower histamine stock with lamb. Don't use fish. Fish is the highest in histamines. Um, so use your meaty lamb bones, lamb shanks, things like that. Only cook for about three hours, just until the lamb's cooked and then take the stock, cool it quickly in the sink. Like I mentioned, just put your whole pot into the sink of cold water. Pour it into containers that will be serving sizes. So maybe like um, two cups is probably good. Um, and then straight into the freezer. So that will help to reduce the histamine levels. Also, if you are just beginning on a gut healing diet and you're um, struggling with histamine issues, you probably will need to bring the stock in very, very slowly. It's a really powerful detox food. So it will cause reactions for those with really bad histamine issues. So you'll need to start very slowly, but it is important to start because the stock and the fermented foods really help to heal that gut lining and rebalance the microbiome, which means you will be able to, um, little by little, be able to um, handle more variety, a wider variety of foods, and um, your histamine issues will decrease as you heal. So even though it's difficult to bring in the stocks, um, start really slowly, even if it's a one drop of stock with your food, in your food, um, and just slowly add more until you're able to cope with it. If you do have a difficulty with histamine issues, it's probably best to get some help from a gut health practitioner first um, so that they can keep an eye on you and help you with bringing all these foods, healing foods in slowly and carefully um, at a rate that suits you. But some people have to start as slowly as one or two drops of stock in a, in a meal or in a cup of water. Um, every few days if they're really sensitive. Most people are fine and can just eat stock just like you would have soup and they won't react. But if you've got really bad histamine issues, you need to go really slowly. So if that's, if that's you, talk to your practitioner. If you need help and you need a practitioner to talk to, um, the one that I work with is Elise Comerford and she's really good with helping people work through those histamine issues and those food reactions. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take the chicken out of the stock and get that into my containers and then I'll be back to answer some questions. Okay, firstly, I take the chicken out of the pot um, just with a pair of tongs and put that aside to cool and then I can take the meat off the bone. If you're using whole chicken or whole chicken pieces, then you just oops, scoop the whole lot out. Um, and like I said before, you can put it on a baking tray and cook it, or you can pop it in the fridge for another meal or the freezer. If you're going to freeze the meat or the pieces of chicken or beef that you, or lamb <laughs> that you've taken out of stock, add a little bit of stock over the meat. So it just keeps it moist in the freezer. And then you can use that stock in another meal as well. A few people have asked me about the ratios for the meat and the bones and the water for your stock. I generally don't measure, but if you need a recipe, um, you can find the recipes for stock in Life Changing Food, our cookbook, um, and there's also a Life Changing Food app. So you'll see that there's um, recipes for chicken stock, 
there's recipes for beef, lamb and pork stock, and there's recipes for fish broth. Um, and basically, um, one whole chicken or two kilos of chicken pieces or two chicken carcasses would be um, enough for three to four litres of water, depending on your pot. Um, with the beef, two kilos of beef bones or pork or lamb um, with three litres of water. And for fish broth, or, or stock one kilo of fish heads and bones to three litres of water. So that's your basic kind of ratio, but like I said, I don't really measure. I just kind of um, cover the, the meat with water and hope for the best. Okay, now um, I'm going to leave the beef for a little bit longer because it needs longer than the chicken. And I'm gonna answer some of your questions that have been sent in. So firstly, someone has asked, um, which do I use meat stocks or bone broths. Um, so I think I've answered that earlier on, but just to recap, the meat stocks are the most healing food for healing the gut. And I started, I changed over to meat stocks uh, a few years ago now, and I just find them a lot easier to digest and also tastier and also quicker and easier. So I mostly use meat stocks. Um, but now and then I'll use a concentrated bone broth in my cooking um, as a spoonful of like a stock paste and adding water. Um, but mostly chicken stocks, two hours, beef stocks, three to four hours, usually about four, lamb stock, three to four hours. Um, and if I use a fish stock, only one to two hours. Okay. Um, someone else says, I'm hoping you take away my fear of making my own bone broth as I haven't made one yet. And I know store-bought isn't quite the same. Um, I bought one today at the shops. It doesn't say how many hours the bones are cooked for, which makes me question if it's going to have any beneficial amount of protein and collagen in it for me. Some of the um, stock concentrates have collagen in them, and I think it could be added, I'm not sure. It will have some, it will still have some benefit. Um, it's better than nothing, but if you're super sensitive, especially to histamines, um, I would recommend the short cooked meat stocks. Um, and they're so easy to make. You've seen how easy that was. Um, so yeah, that's probably, yeah, store-bought um, stocks. You can get really good quality meat stocks from health food shops. I know Star Anise, um, Broth Bar and Larder down in Sydney sell beautiful stocks and broths and you can, I think you can order online, I'm not sure, but I know that you can go in and buy them there. Um, and there's others popping up around the place now, but yeah, find out how long they're cooked for. If you're sensitive to histamines though, it's best to make your own because you can really make sure that you're only doing short cooking and straight away getting them into the fridge or freezer, um, or the freezer if you're sensitive to histamines. Okay, someone wants to know if I've ever used turkey bones. Yes, I have. Um, leftover roast turkey becomes a broth at our house. It always has at Christmas time or whenever. Um, again, it's not as easy to digest because it's been cooked already and then you're cooking it for a while afterwards. Um, but it is, it is delicious. But you can definitely do um, a turkey meat stock with the raw meat on the bones, just the same as you would chicken, but probably three to four hours because it's a more of a brown meat and it takes a bit longer to cook. Um, but basically, once the meat's coming off the bones and it's nice and soft, then it's done. That's pretty much the rule of thumb. Yes, you can mix chicken and turkey if you want to. Um, I generally don't mix meats, but you can if you want to. Um, someone also says, I've noticed sometimes when you're making a stock with edible pieces of chicken, you will pop the drumsticks in the oven once the stock is finished with a sauce or herbs. Does the chicken not dry out? Okay, the secret to this is make sure you've got some oil drizzled over or some melted butter or ghee so um, the skin gets nice and crisp and make sure the heat is high in the oven and it will just crisp up the skin, but it won't dry out the meat. If you leave it on a lower heat, for a longer time, yes, it will dry out the meat. Okay, um, next question. I think you've probably answered most of my questions, but probably what difference, well, what difference different bones make? Okay, so um, I'm guessing she means 
is there a different is there different health benefits between different bones um i'm not sure about that i think you're going to get um, great health benefits from any meat stock although fish is really good for iodine so if you have um, low iodine fish stock is great uh, other than that like I mentioned earlier lamb stock is lower in histamines than other stocks because lamb is a lower histamine meat um, now what else does she ask here what to do with excess meat from stocks Okay, so freeze it with a little bit of stock covering or go ahead and make it into another meal. So soups, um, I sometimes use the poached chicken and shred it and put it through, um, like mix it with a bit of mayonnaise and make that as a sandwich filling. Um, I use it on wraps, as a, a meat in wraps. Um, I make palaf, so lamb or chicken palaf with the stock to simmer the rice in and then some of the cooked meat stirred through lots of spices and onion it's delicious some raisins um, that recipe is on my blog if you just search quirky cooking chicken palaf it will come up palaf is spelled p-i-l-a-f if anyone's wondering um, that one is really delicious if you go onto my blog i'll put the link in the show notes but if you go onto the blog there is um, a post on broths and stocks with lots of ideas for recipes there as well Okay, um, using carcasses versus meat on bones. All right, so if you're just using a carcass, you won't get a very jellyish stock if it's just the carcass. Um, the flavor will be nice, but you won't get a lot of that gelatinous goodness. That's why I put the chicken feet in with the carcass or wings or some chicken legs, something that's got the cartilage and the um, connective tissue makes a really good stock. Okay, I want to start incorporating and using stocks and broths and I know that I'll have to make some adjustments to how or what I cook, but I'm excited. Yay, I'm excited too. <laughs> okay, someone else asks, is there a good vegan broth? This is um, a bit of a tricky question because sure, you can make vegan and vegetarian broths and stocks and they're very delicious and you can put all different mushrooms and vegetables and get that beautiful flavor um, base to base recipes on and there's lots of recipes online for that um, so if you're just looking for flavor yes there are vegetarian and vegan stocks and broths if you're looking for the gut healing benefits you're not going to get a truly gut healing broth or stock from vegetables vegetables are great for cleansing that they're, they're just their job is to really clean out ourselves to detox our bodies um, to feed us the nutrients from um, plants, but they're not great for um, healing cell damage because they don't have the amino acids that meats have. Um, so we really need um, we really need meat stocks for healing a damaged gut lining because those amino acids that we talked about earlier, proline, glycine, collagen, um, they are the glue that mends the cells and um, helps those tissues to really um, close up and be tight again. Um, if you are relying just on vegetables, you will find it very difficult to heal the gut lining, but have a chat to your gut health practitioner about it and um, see what they say. But basically a gut healing stock is based on meat and bones. Okay, so do different meats have different benefits? Oh, we talked about that, sorry. Um, okay, some different cuts of meat and bones to use. Um, we didn't really talk a lot about lamb. Lamb stock is one of my favorites. Whenever I, it's funny, whenever I go away and travel, when I come home, I crave lamb stock. I don't know what it is, but um, I usually, my favorite, favorite stock is when I make it with lamb shanks. Um, it turns out really thick and gelatinous and it's, delicious flavor um, also lamb neck chops um, if you go if you get a side of lamb you can get all the bits and pieces that are kind of scruffy and never get sold at the butchers um, that makes beautiful stock it will end up with a layer of fat on top of the stock that's fine you put it into the fridge or freezer that will set on top and then you can take that off and store it in the fridge or freezer and use that for frying things like potatoes 
pumpkin, um, using as a fat in your cooking for meats. And um, it's a beautiful flavor, makes the best roast potatoes, lamb fat. So also when I was mentioning about the beef stock earlier, how it has a layer of fat on top, um, you can use that tallow, it's called tallow. You can use that in your cooking. You can also use it for seasoning your pans. So if you have cast iron pans or solid techniques um, formed iron pans, use that tallow for seasoning. So lots of purposes for it. Um, in the old days, they made hand creams and skin creams from tallow because it's very nourishing and holds in the moisture. Okay, I'm not saying you should do that because then you'll smell like meat, but <laughs> they do make creams from tallows, but I think they filter them to get the meat smell out. Okay, have all the dogs on the block following you otherwise. <laughs> that would be funny. Okay, um, is it safe to store stocks out of the fridge in preserving jars for a couple of days? Ooh, I wouldn't. Um, maybe someone else knows the answer to that one, but I've never done that and I would be really wary of doing that. I much prefer, like I said, to get them into the freezer really quickly or if I'm going to use some in the next day or two, I'll leave it in the fridge. Um, but I wouldn't generally do the heating, sealing, preserving jars and then leave it out. Um, I don't know of anyone that does that. If you do it, let us know, but yeah. Okay, so um, someone else has asked, I want to make a 10 litre chicken stock. Can you please tell me exactly how many kilos of meat or carcass to water and salt I need? Okay, 10 litre chicken stock. So um, two carcasses per, we'll say three to four litres. So 3.3, we'll say. So that would be six carcasses for 10 litres or um, six kilos of chicken for 10 litres of stock. Um, so I think that's right. <laughs> so trial and error. But you can top up the stock a little bit if you have to with a bit more water because sometimes it does reduce, like I'm saying. Um, you do get more gelatin more gelatinous stock if you let it reduce though. Okay, so someone else asks, I'm interested if you recommend avoiding broths completely for histamine issues or just make really quick ones. Yes, avoid long cooked bone broths. If you have histamine issues, do not have long cooked bone broths. You will react only short cooked stocks and you may even have to just do a one hour chicken stock and, and straight away freeze it and start with small amounts. So Talk to a gut health practitioner if you're not sure. Can you overcook a bone broth? Definitely, I've done it and it tastes foul. It tastes kind of burnt. I, I used to think that the longer you cooked a bone broth, the better because you get more and more nutrients out of the bones, but um, it just starts to taste really awful, I must admit, and I'm glad I don't do that anymore. Hi, Joe. I have one question. I was watching your Insta story yesterday. Your lamb broth is completely clear. When I make a broth, it is quite dark. What am I doing wrong? Um, probably if it's a broth, it's being simmered for a long time. It's reducing, you're getting little shards of the bone um, disintegrating into the broth. And so it will be a darker color. And yes, it can burn, which is going on from the last question. Um, a meat stock will be clearer and lighter in color. You can strain your stock if you want a really clear stock, like if you want to use it to make consomme. Is bone broth good for someone with type two diabetes? Again, I would start with short cooked meat stocks, not bone broths, um, but yes, definitely. It would be good for people with diabetes because you're, um, well, obviously it's not a sugary sweet food. It's very nutrient dense and it's, he it's a healing food. It is the most foundational healing food that there is. Um, what is best for low FODMAPs? If I have broth and it makes me bloated, do I stop drinking it? Okay, I would say yes. Stop drinking long cooked bone broths. Go to very short cooked meat stocks. Have a very tiny amount and build it up slowly. If you start bloating, then you need to pull it back a little and go slowly. FODMAPs is a, sim a symptom of poor gut health, so your meat stock's gonna be super important for healing those issues.
I think I've answered all the questions that I've been sent, but if you have another question that I didn't cover, feel free to email me at help at quirkycooking.com.au or you can comment on this post and ask there or you can direct message me on Instagram, Joe Witten, Quirky Cooking, or on Facebook, Quirky Cooking. Um, there's also the Quirky Cooking chat group, which is a great place to go to ask your questions because there's lots of Quirky Cooking experts in there that will answer you. If I'm a bit slow, someone will answer you. Um, and we also have a Quirky Cooking Gaps group for those of you who are working on your gut health. Also, don't forget my good friend, Elise Comerford, who is a nutritionist and gut health specialist, is working with me to present an online program that goes for eight weeks where we really dive into all the different healing foods, how to get them into your diet, how to reduce the food stress and the lifestyle stress so that your gut can begin to heal and to heal your family as well. It's a really gentle approach to gut health and we'd love for you to join us. The um, next intake to the program is 30th of July so if you've got any questions about that, feel free to email help at quirkycooking.com.au or you can go to the events page on my blog for details. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm.